Are PCB designers becoming an endangered species? Hi there, I'm John McMillan and welcome to this edition of PCB Tech Talk, the podcast where we'll be talking about design tools, the EDA industry, and the questions that you're asking. I'll be bringing in special guests from time to time, including subject matter experts and EDA industry leaders. So be sure to subscribe to this podcast, let me know the topics you'd like to discuss, and if you'd like to be my guest right here on PCB Tech Talk. Today, I'm going to talk about the PCB designer profession and perhaps bust the myth that PCB designers are quickly becoming a vanishing breed. You know, I recall vividly conversations as far back as 15, 20 years ago with fellow PCB designers and coworkers regarding the fact that there were no new young PCB designers entering the field. And as we looked around at each other and looked back at all the folks we'd either knew or worked with as PCB designers throughout the years, what we pretty much came away with is that for the most part, the age range between us and all the PCB designers we each knew was within plus or minus five or so years of our own ages. And this was from within a good sized team of PCB designers at a very big worldwide high tech company. And most of the PCB designers were senior level and most were even recruited and relocated to work there. I often wonder if most of the PCB designers out there are really that old. So I was reading the Printed Circuit Design and Fab Magazine Annual PCB Designer Survey, which I always enjoy reading every year, and their survey for 2014 reported that the average age of respondents is 50 years old, with 54% being above 50, and 25% of the respondents were specifically between the ages of 51 and 55. So it kind of indicated that more than a quarter of these PCB designers, which coincidentally falls in line with the last of the baby boomers, are, or will soon be, thinking about retirement. Which frankly seems a bit young yet to me to be passing any batons, especially uh, thinking about retirement. That said, there are clearly fewer younger folks entering the PCB design field. It's actually hard for me to imagine today a high school senior saying, I want to go to college and learn how to lay out PCBs. I can't tell you how many folks, young or even older, that aren't techies or engineers, of course, that really don't know where and how or what PCBs are, or really think about how electronics work, like the cell phones they carry around in their pockets, or that the laptops shoved into their backpacks are housing securely concealed printed circuit boards. I know this. I have four kids, and on more than one occasion, I've seen the gloss over eyes looking at my screen when trying to explain what PCB design is all about. As expected, folks just swipe their screens and they push the buttons on their electronic devices and really don't give much, if any, thought to what's inside or the hows and the whats of how it all works. And if there was that rare young person that wanted to be a PCB designer, Could they even find a college or trade school or any other program to specifically learn the art of PCB design? So where did these older PCB designers come from? I read a great blog in the All Aboard series last January in Electronic Design News. It was entitled simply, How Did You Learn PCB Layout? You can search and find this yourself online at edn.com and read the entire post if you're interested. And I'll also include the link to it in my podcast notes. The blog's pointing out that even as a double E student, you may have only uh, completed a few design projects, and that may have been it, but not really gaining enough pure PCB layout knowledge to enter the workforce and complete a complex, manufacturable PCB design out of the gate. The article identifies learning PCB design on the job or perhaps transitioning from an electronic tech field. I'll add to that transitioning from a design or drafting role, along with mentor training helped with learning design. Those resources in conjunction with applying what was learned in school were very likely the foundation of today's quinquagenarian pool of PCB designers. Well, here's one path and maybe it sounds familiar to you. Many folks I know from the mid to late 80s, now not so coincidentally in their 50s, either started out as electrical and or mechanical engineers or designers or draftsmen. Many started on the board, hand drawing schematics. Others may have had access to early CAD tools like computer vision doing electromechanical design 
or even a CALM assistant for PCB design, digitizing hand-drawn layers of traces, which for sure beat having to hand tape them. I can attest to that. For example, my local junior college at that time had classrooms equipped with drafting tables. You'd eventually get on an AutoCAD system, but you still had to learn the skill, technical aspects, the techniques, and the rules of design and drafting first. I'm not just talking about using scales and line work. I'm talking about learning about different materials, bin radiuses, geometric dimension and tolerancing, clearances, standards and electronic circuits, schematic diagrams, symbology, design orientation, artwork, and the list goes on and on. I actually designed my first PCBs in the mid-1980s in Florida on the Space Coast at Harris Corporation in Melbourne. Uh, and even though there was a CALMA system in place when I started there, newbies to laying out PCBs were taught and mentored by, I'll use the term, seasoned professionals. These folks had been working on light tables and had hand-taped printed circuit boards for years before they had access to CAD systems at all. So I was taught what I consider the art and the technique and the thought process of laying out an optimal, functional, fabricatable PCB design first by hand taping. It's pretty easy to tell how long PCB designers have been in the business when they start talking about bishop graphics, rolls of tape and ruby lith in one hand, and swapping between a non-photo blue pencil and an exacto knife or stylus in the other. That's how I started too, and there is no doubt that hand taping PCBs taught me the necessity to both study and visualize the PCB as a finished product early and throughout the layout phase. It was really like trying to solve a puzzle. You were handed a multi-sheet schematic diagram and a bill of materials, obviously with no picture of what the final layout will look like, and then taking everything you knew about the project's intent and PCB design and create the best possible design. There was already a lot you needed to know to design PCBs then, like understanding that designing PCBs required lots of knowledge, knowledge of electronics design, manufacturing, assembly processes, and so on. And there are literally dozens of thoughts going on in the mind of a PCB designer, thinking, where do I place the component and why? How will it be oriented? How does it connect to other components? Where and how will the PCB be installed, etc., etc.? Today, there's a lot more you need to know. Designs are just getting more and more complicated. Nearly all of today's PCB designs involve meeting tight, high-speed signal integrity requirements in nearly every technology. Things like min-max trace lengths, differential pairs with length spacing and min-max separation rules and clocks tuning, and this stuff is just commonplace. Not to mention thermal concerns, electromagnetics, power integrity, RF, the list goes on and on. All of which require specific knowledge and consideration throughout the design process. In PCB designs, everything matters. So how do these quinquagenarians, these 25 plus years experience PCB design veterans know so much about designing today's most modern, complex PCBs? Well, because many of these PCB designers are the ones that have evolved and driven and pushed the technology into the design tools out of need and necessity from ever evolving design technologies. I can still remember the first time I saw a surface mount component on the bill of materials for a design. The design tool version I was using at the time started out having very little support for surface mount components, but the designer's needs communicated back to the EDA tool companies through the submission of enhancements and features played an important role in helping to drive and enhance the design tool capabilities. With growing needs in areas like constraint management, design rules, fan out automation, pad entry options, and the list goes on and on, this method of partnering with the tool vendors and specifying and submitting ideas and enhancements to address specific design challenges and demands is still in place today. These 25 plus year folks that have learned along the way, they, along with all design tool users, continue to drive the functionality into the tools they use today for PCB design out of need. The need for tools to do more, do it better, and do it faster. And like modern technology itself, it is consistently evolving. Speeds get faster, designs get smaller, and the time you have to get the product done is shrinking. If you want a glimpse into what some of the 25 plus year or old timer PCB designers think about PCB design then, now, and in the future, you should take some time and read a discussion that ended up pretty much trending, in my opinion, with 88 comments the last time I looked, that was started on LinkedIn. 
in the old timers PCB designer group entitled simply what happened to us passing our skills and knowledge to the youth. You might even be compelled to add to the discussion yourself. So I'll put the link for this also in the podcast show notes for you to look at later. All of this said, today's beginning PCB designer will need to walk in the door already understanding everything that these old timers have spent their careers perfecting. As electronic techs or double E's, they will most certainly have an understanding of signal integrity, high-speed constraint requirements, circuit simulation and analysis, and performance, and so on. It's the other design practices and rules, those hows and the whats and the whys, and the experience in being able to visualize the design, looking five steps ahead to understand why the land pattern needs a constraint area and and why you need to be purposeful when placing and orienting decoupling caps and the via fan outs to ensure that routing channels are maximized. You know, fabrication requirements are taken into consideration and knowing the end product will fit. Knowing all these other things are what the 25 plus year PCB design folks can and must teach the next generation of PCB designers. Should we really be surprised that we're seeing more and more the trend of seeking electrical engineers or folks from a comparable electronics field to take on PCB designer positions? Probably not. The new EE grad may find that PCB design is another job responsibility or task, though advancement more likely into a pure hardware design engineer role may very well motivate them and move them away from the physical PCB design task. Sure, some EEs may find themselves drawn to focus their careers to specialize on PCB design itself, But personally, I have not seen this to be the typical case. The other trend we live with and must consider is that the PCB layout, since it is a specialized and unique skill set and apprenticeship to many old timers, has made it a prime target for outsourcing. That is, businesses, particularly smaller ones, have conceded that yes, getting the PCB designed requires the expertise of a PCB designer with a unique skill set. We've seen big companies offshore the PCB layout to save money. And understandably, we see many small companies that may not generate enough products per year to justify employing a dedicated PCB designer. So there's also a large percentage of PCB designs being outsourced to either local design bureaus or perhaps overseas. Many companies have determined that the PCB design layout is best suited for outsourcing since the skill set remains specialized and the cost of ownership, particularly for some of the EDA tools that can handle all of today's high-speed, highly constrained designs, may be too expensive to justify owning. The annual survey from Printed Circuit Design and Fab that I referred to at the start of this podcast did indicate that we might be seeing the gap that will be left when these quinquagenarian PCB designers, also affectionately referred to as the old-timer PCB designers, finally do retire, may be starting to get filled in. That is, it was up 5% from a mere 7.6% of responding designers in 2013 to a 2014 total of 12.4%. It will be very interesting to see if this trend continues in the coming 2015 survey. So, are these 50-something career PCB designers a vanishing breed? I think it's probably a decade or so too soon to start writing them all off. But what I do believe is that they are ready and willing and able to mentor and grow the next generation of PCB designers. They care a great deal about not only the latest technologies, but all of the thought processes and the art of PCB design. I thought if I was given the opportunity to share just one thing with the next generation of PCB designers, what would that be? Firstly, it's very hard to mention just one, but what came to mind was be prepared for and expect changes. I can't tell you how many times throughout the PCB design flow that design changes were made, even right up to the last days before the design was scheduled to be sent out for fabrication. Part changes or an unexpected component pinout changes happen, so be prepared. So I want to know what you think. If you could just give one piece of advice to the PCB designers of the future, Send me the one thing that you would want to share with PCB designers, and I'm going to include that in a future special podcast. So, what do you think about the next generation of PCB designers? I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this topic, and if you have something you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. As always, be sure to check out the podcast show notes. 
There you'll find the link to the articles and discussion that I referred to throughout this podcast, as well as my email address, where you can send me your comments and questions. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe and catch the next episode of PCB Tech Talk.